Okay. Well, um, welcome everybody. And uh, again, my apologies for being a little bit late. Um, typically, actually, I give this talk after uh, Dr. Solis presents his uh, mechanical dog, uh, intelligent <laughs> little table. Um, but uh, not today. Um, so I'll go directly into the uh, lecture. Um, so the, this lecture is divided into three parts. Um, at the first part, I will uh, just talk about uh, AI in general. I think the second part, I have many examples of applications in machine learning. And then the third part, I'll tell you how we actually uh, teach uh, a, a computer to learn something without programming it for that particular task. Um, so let me first uh, um, talk about something to, to remove some doubts about some misconceptions. Um, people think that um, computer scientists and, and especially those who are focusing on AI um, uh, assume that uh, human intelligence is more or less uh, solved and that machines will soon replace humans. It, it, it is not true, it's definitely not true. Um, even though uh, in many tasks we have uh, reached, uh, equaled the skills and capacities of humans and sometimes even surpassed them, um, we are not close to the intelligence of humans yet. Um, Maybe one day we'll get there, but it's, we're not there today. We're far from it. Um, okay, we talk about singularity. I don't know if you started uh, yes. that picture about singularity. Um, this is the time when computers will actually um, lead innovation because they they will uh, recursively self-improve themselves and and and. Uh, um, it's a time where we can't we can't imagine what will happen. We can imagine that could happen, but we can't imagine what will happen afterwards. It'll go so fast. Um, some people believe the singularity is at our doorstep. I mean, it's very close, and some people don't believe in it at all. That will never happen, and some people believe that it will happen eventually, but uh, uh, we still have to wait for it. And uh, I'm among the, the, the last group. I think it, it can happen. Um, it can surprise us actually, but based on what we know today, um, I will not see it in my lifetime. Uh, that's my position. <laughs> so um, let's see. So yeah, first part, I'll talk about what is AI, the past and the present. Uh, second part, I'll talk about, uh, yeah, the, the cautious about uh, the future, and I will show examples. And then finally, uh, I will talk about how machine learning uh, works. Um, but let's let's uh, start with something else first, just to motivate, motivate the discussion. Um, and maybe uh, I will contradict myself because I will, I, I just said that I don't believe the singularity is uh, very close. But at the same time, I'll show you how we are living an incredible acceleration in innovation, uh, thanks to many tools that uh, are suddenly in, in, in front of us. Uh, and that's why I said we could be surprised by the singularity, uh, something we didn't anticipate may happen. So uh, look, at, look at this. Uh, you probably recognize a very famous picture of the uh, Wright brothers uh, executing their first flight ever. This was in 1903, okay? Um, 1903, think about it. This is where, uh, actually my grandfather was born already. <laughs> Makes it a bit old, but uh, I can tell you that uh, it's not that far away. Um, but in 1969, so basically 66 years later, uh, we were able to walk on the moon. And that's, 
that's impressive in 66 years. Um, to make it even more impressive, last year, we were able to fly a helicopter on Mars. So 50 years later, after walking on the moon, we have a helicopter that is flying over the surface of Mars. Um, and this shows you the acceleration. This technology is going very, very, very fast. So only 120 years, we just learned how to fly on Earth, and now we fly on another planet. Uh, so if I put it on an axis like that, this is to better uh, emphasize the, uh, the acceleration. So I said in 120 years, we were able to fly from, from, from flying for the first time on Earth, we are now flying on Mars. If I take that 120 years and flip it the other way and say, what happened 120 years before 1903? And uh, well, that's 1780 something or 1770 something. Believe it or not, that's when we build the first, it's called the turtle, the first submarine. Okay, uh, so we were already technologically not bad at all <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a, the human race. Um, very close to that date in 1790, that's the first um, reference of the first bicycle in Scotland. Actually, pinpointing the origin of the first bicycle is very difficult, and, and many historians are saying different things. Uh, I think they discovered the early sketches of the bicycle by uh, Gian Giacomo uh, Caprotti, who is the uh, a, a pupil of Leonardo da Vinci. So in the 1500s, um, they don't know if they ever built it, like the helicopter of Leonardo da Vinci. I don't know if you know that, that he, he drew a helicopter. He never built it. We don't know if this bicycle was ever built. Um, but in, in 1790, uh, there were evidence of, of bicycles in Scotland. And then in 1817, this uh, German Baron, uh, Karl von Dice, he, he built this uh, uh, Laufmaschine. Laufmaschine, so it's a, a thing you sit on and with your feet you push and you run. It's a, it's a machine for running. Um, and it took a while um, for this uh, bone shaker to be, uh, be that's almost uh, uh, half a century from 1817. They moved from this Lauf machine to the bone shaker. They call it bone shaker because there's no, no suspension, no nothing. There's no rubber for the, the tire. Uh, and then everybody knows this uh, penny farthing. Um, that's 1870. I mean, it took a long time, almost a century to move from the first bicycles to this. And we know the bicycles today. So you see, it was very slow compared to flying for the first time on Earth to flying on Mars. So you can imagine in half a century, we'll have a huge, huge uh, um, leap forward. Ironically, at the same time as um, uh, David uh, Bushnell was uh, uh, imagining the uh, submarine, there's something else that happened, and you're going to laugh, uh, because uh, uh, that's when they introduced this idea of uh, vaccination. It wasn't called vaccine. It's, a, it's immunization for smallpox. So uh, Edward uh, Jenner, who was a, a doctor in England, noticed that um, cow, the cows had the similar virus, but didn't get as sick from it. And he had this idea of using the, the, the cowpox to treat humans um, against uh, smallpox. And it's only later that uh, um, I think Louis Pasteur, Louis Pasteur used the same idea to uh, deal with other diseases, including rabies. So it's, I think I have the date here. Uh, no, I didn't put it, but anyways, um, do you know, uh, I think Louis Pasteur's in 1881, it was for anthrax immunization, indeed, uh, in 1881. Do you know why uh, uh, Louis Pasteur called it vaccine? Any idea? It wasn't called vaccine for smallpox. It's later that they called it vaccine. And I, I believe it was Louis Pasteur who called it uh, vaccin in French, and then it became vaccine internationally. 
Well, it has to do with cows. Vaca, vaca means uh, uh, cow, and it's because uh, 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 Edward Jenner used the uh, cowpox to immunize the humans uh, against smallpox. And so uh, uh, from vaca, vaccine, so it's an immunization using the idea from the, the, the cows. Uh, anyways, today, so we are talking about 120 years plus 120 years, 240 years. We have a vaccine for 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 uh, COVID-19 and people are not smart enough to adopt it. So they're still saying that I don't believe in it. So on one hand, we are talking about incredible progression. On the other hand, I don't know if it's a progression or going backwards. Um, anyways, I don't see your reaction, but let's talk about intelligence. Let's go to serious stuff. So before we talk about artificial intelligence, AI, um, what is what is intelligence? Um, I, I put it here between parentheses, computational intelligence, because I, I prefer calling it computational intelligence instead of artificial intelligence. We have intelligence or no intelligence. There's no artificial. But computational intelligence means it's an intelligence that has been computed. Uh, artificially, yes, but um, anyway, so what is intelligence? Anybody can volunteer a definition? No, no reaction. That's the difference between doing it online and doing it live. I can look at somebody in class and then they they feel compelled to say something, but here on online, we can't do it. <laughs> um, I can give it a shot. Good, um, go ahead, thank you. Uh, so I think uh, in intelligence might be like the ability to solve a problem. And so it could be like academics, but it could also be any other kind of problem. So how well something fixes it. Solving a problem, that's cool. Actually uh, identifying that there is a problem and then uh, and the necessity of having a solution and then solving it. That's cool, yeah, I like that. Uh, any other ideas? Well, speaking of solving problems, is also ability. Yeah, go ahead. It need, like I think it's uh, reasoning ability is also <laughs> reasoning. Reasoning. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I like that. Reasoning. So we we also need to reason to solve problems. So it's encompassed in that solving problems uh, definition of intelligence. That's cool. I like that. Um, Speaking of solving problems, I have to see uh, if I have this video here. Yes, I go. Look at this, not a human trying to solve a problem. Oops, does it, how do I, I have to go back. Do you see the video? Yes. Yeah, good, okay. I don't know if there is sound, but it doesn't mean the sound is irrelevant. So this, animal is smelling something but can't get to it so that's a problem i identified a problem now this animal needs to solve the problem how can i solve the problem i need to get to that food it's i'm using a tool this tool will allow me to get to the food. I can get it. That's another sub problem. I have to solve the other sub problem to solve the big problem. Get momentum. There you go. So it's dividing the problem into sub-problems, each one solving it separately. It's hot, I can't get to it. How do I get to it? Throw it on the floor because it's too hot. So solving problems by dividing, dividing and conquering. So that's, is that smart? Is that intelligent? Well, look at this one. This is not really a problem. Okay, I think it's this one here. That's a crow. 
sliding with a, a cover of something. Doesn't work, do it again. It works on the other side of the roof. So this crow is just having fun, having fun using a tool. It's not the wing, it's not a feather, it's not something natural. It's actually human made, um, getting it from the, the rubbish somewhere. Um, let's see another case, that's, that's a bird. Maybe these are big animals. Who can tell me what that is? Well, I'll zoom in, I'll show you. These are ants that need to attack a wasp's nest to get the larvae and eat them. And they build a bridge using themselves. How do they think about that? How do they conceive this, engineer this amazing bridge? It's, I don't know, nobody knows. Is it the idea of one of them, a leader, the queen? Or is it the collective somehow? They learn how to do it. Um, but they build a bridge to solve a problem. The problem is to get to that wasp's nest and get all the larvae that they can get. That's impressive. Is that intelligence? So are only humans bestowed with intelligence? Um, so intelligence is defined by, in, in, in many ways by different people, philosophers and, and, and scientists, and, and there's no standard definition. In psychology, there's a theory of intelligence and, and uh, some, some researchers have suggested that intelligence is, is a, a is a single and general ability that humans have and don't have uh, or don't have, but others define intelligence uh, encompassing a range of aptitudes and skills and talent. Um, and, and the question is, is it specific to humans or we have other inhabitants of this planet that also have intelligence? Um, I can tell you that um, for example, somebody who is looking at nature and then painting it in, in a representation that gives us depth and like 3D on just on a, on a, on a piece of paper, uh, that's also intelligence that I personally don't have. Okay, so there are different skills and different aptitudes that constitute also a sort of intelligence um, that some people have, some people don't have. Some people learn, some people don't have the aptitude to learn. Uh, so intelligence is not easy to define. This is what I'm trying to say. It's a complicated thing. And it's not something that we, we only humans possess. Um, different people, different entities can possess. And if, if we can have different entities and we have different definitions of intelligence, maybe we can have it in a machine. Uh, oops, I can't go to the next. How do I go to the next? There you go. So intelligence, um, then, as I said, many definitions um, is coming from Latin and, and it means actually comprehend, uh, uh, perceive. Um, um, and and in, in the Middle Ages, we were using it to refer to understanding something. So in, in the dictionary intelligence, in the, for example, the Merriam-Webster, uh, they define intelligence as the ability to learn and understand, to do uh, or to deal with new or trying uh, uh, new situations. So the, the, the skilled use of reason, somebody said the reasoning before when I asked you to, to, to define intelligence. Um, so dealing also with new situations is actually quite interesting too, because you have to, you have to make some judgments, you have to, 
uh, reuse by analogy the experience that you had before? Does it apply to this new situation and things like that? Uh, here's another definition. Intelligence is the ability to learn, understand, and think in a logical way about things, the ability to do this well. That's still vague. What is well? Uh, but they're talking about logic here. I don't know if the ants were using logic. Probably the dog was using logic. I don't know about the crow. Um, um, so intelligence is this ability to acquire knowledge from this experience and to apply this knowledge or skill for the appropriate situation. So you have, you have to store this knowledge somehow and retrieve it when you need it because you're faced with a situation that is similar to what you experienced before. Um, intelligence is the capacity to learn, reason, and adapt to new situations. Uh, adapt what? Well, adapt what you learned or adapt yourself. Uh, intelligence is the capacity to change our environment to our advantage to the betterment of our condition. This is very, well, it's not only specific to the, the, the humans. When you saw the dog, the dog pushed the chair, so made changes to the environment. Why? Because the dog realized that the chair closer to the counter would allow him to jump to uh, uh, on the counter. So the, the dog was intelligent enough, had that capacity, to change the, to, to judge first that that chair was appropriate tool and change the environment so that their condition, the condition of the dog was different. Now they can reach the food. Um, intelligence is the capacity or the ability to perceive or infer information and to retain it as knowledge to be applied towards adaptive behaviors within an environment or context. So adaptive behaviors is also has to do with the adapting the environment like the dog did. But the interesting thing is this ability to realize that there's, this knowledge is useful. I'd better keep it because I may use it down the road. And if I keep it, it would be useless if I can access it at the right time. So being able to access it quickly when I need it for the right uh, um, condition um, to improve my situation, that is also part of intelligence. And that could be uh, connected to the ants. Now, when they require, acquired that knowledge, is it knowledge acquired during the experience of each ant? Or is it the experience of the whole collective of the ants? And it's passed from one generation to the other. There is enough evidence to show that actually there is some knowledge that is acquired in one generation and used in another generation, whether it's in butterflies or other kinds of insects. Um, so this being said, where's my... So um, in psychology, I don't know if I have time to go through psychology, I'm gonna skip this slide about the different theories, but I, I wanna go to AI, what is artificial intelligence? So we talked about intelligence at a high level. Um, what is this intelligence that we want to have in machines or we have currently in machines? Then I'll be talking about what is machine learning, how this machine is acquiring this knowledge and have it available so it can use it later when it's faced with a condition that is similar to the condition it saw during or experienced during the, uh, the past. And then I'll show you some examples. Okay, so um, what is into artificial intelligence? Um, if I tell you something like this, uh, this is what people know and what they have been exposed to in terms of definition of AI, uh, probably you too as well. Um, they see in a newspaper, um, a journalist reporting uh, on technology and what happens today it says, well, the AI market will be worth $60 billion by 2025. The only thing you can get out of this is that, well, AI must be very important. This is a big thing that will change our lives. $60 billion is a lot. Um, and then you hear some important politician says, um, the one who dominates AI will rule the world. And uh, if you learn that the person who said that is actually Putin, 
then you realize this must be extremely important. I mean, the one who dominates AI will rule the world, that's big. And it's actually uh, not a, a, a hypothetical question, I mean, a statement, this is, uh, this is very true. Um, but unfortunately, the definitions or the information that we get to build our own definition of what AI is, comes from newspapers and magazines and, and maybe movies, uh, science fiction movies. And often these movies, unfortunately, and even the magazines are just looking for a sensational kind of experience. And they, they don't portray uh, uh, reality as, as it is. They, they actually uh, portray an unrealistic picture and, and very often negative, pessimistic about what AI is and can do. Um, and and the, the way they portray it is them, the machine against us. They are threats, they will eliminate us. So it's the, they show the bad things, um, the, the machine against humans. And, and then the machines become this existential threat. They will eliminate us, so we don't want it. The reality, AI today, you have it in your pocket. It's the smartphones. The smartphones actually are one of the best uh, uh, representation of what we can do with AI today. There's a lot of AI in your, your smartphone. Uh, for example, as you're typing and, and uh, um, the editor that you're using is actually suggesting words. It, it can predict the next word that you are writing. That's using AI. Um, the, um, the, the locker that, that locks the, the phone until you want and you look at it with your face or your, your, your fingerprint or whatever, that's also using AI. There's a lot of AI in there. And I don't see any threat in there. Well, there could be threats. There's always a, a secondary users for different things. This is how the experts have defined artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the science of making machines do things that would require intelligence if done by humans. Um, this is Marvin Minsky, one of the pioneers of uh, uh, AI. Um, is another definition. Artificial intelligence is, this, is the discipline striving to get machines behave intelligently by performing tasks that would normally require human level intelligence. And that's why you see a lot of uh, demonstration with games. So very tough games like chess and checker and, and go. And because those who excel in these games, we say they are smart, they're masters in chess. So they're very intelligent. So if computers can do that, then computers are intelligent. Not really. But uh, for me, um, artificial intelligence is an enhancement of human creativity. For me, it's basically um, a tool that will allow us to do things better, things that we used to do, but we can do now better thanks to this tool, or things we were not able to do and now we can do it with this tool. So it's a tool like any other tool. It's like a screwdriver or, or a hammer uh, at a very high level, obviously. And, and artificial intelligence is a moving target. What we used to call artificial intelligence before is not that smart anymore. And, and the bar goes higher and higher, basically. Um, like, uh, believe it or not, uh, in the uh, early days, people thought that uh, um, a word processor was intelligent. Why? Because, well, word processors came immediately after typewriters. And when you typewrite and, and try to uh, justify your lines, oh my gosh, that was hard. And now the word processor can do it. You don't even think about it and even detects spelling mistakes and corrects your grammar and, and does a lot of stuff. But who thinks that a word processor is intelligent today? I mean, we take it for granted, okay? So this is why this, this AI, uh, uh, the concept of AI is a moving target. Okay, so let me show you AI in the context. So, and in the history in, uh, uh, of AI. AI started in the fifties, it's not, yesterday. So it started a long time ago, 70 years ago. In the 50s, uh, people thought, well, um, actually, we can build intelligent machines very easily. They thought it was easy. Just by dividing the any task that requires intelligence, we cut it into pieces. If we can program each piece together, put them together, I mean, each piece separately, and then put them together, then we can build an intelligent machine. 
And it wasn't obvious. And, and in the beginning to show the intelligence of what they were doing, uh, they targeted um, games like chess and checkers. And, and there was a huge optimism that this could succeed. Um, there was an incredible high expectation because of this hype. Unfortunately, um, all the programs that they did, they were just mimicking some intelligent activities. And people have demonstrated that this is utopia. It will never happen, at least with what they had as tools at that time. So there was a disillusionment because there was a high expectation. Suddenly, there was no delivery of what they, they promised. So there was a disillusionment. Uh, and it, it, they had to wait till the 80s. In the 80s, some people continued. They were persevering were perseverant and continued working on some aspects of uh, uh, what they defined as artificial intelligence. And one of them is a subfield within artificial intelligence called machine learning. And machine learning, basically, you, you try to uh, make a machine learn a task without explicitly programming it for that task. And we'll see examples later. Uh, so here I'm showing the example of recognizing spam from non-spam. And that was so successful that it brought back the attention to AI. Um, and it's only, uh, so it brought back some hope and it created some uh, very interesting uh, applications for disruptions in many fields. Um, you don't know it, but uh, not a long time ago, for my generation anyways, and, and, and Kim will, will remember that, we used to write checks. Um, and when you write a check, so everybody was using checks. You have to read the numbers that are written in there. And the machine had trouble reading these numbers because people have different handwritings. Same thing with the postal codes on envelopes. You couldn't have humans looking at all postal codes and, and route these envelopes in different places. So we, we used machine learning to learn to recognize these letters and, and digits automatically. Um, so it was very successful for very specific applications. And it's only around 2012 that a new subfield in machine learning called deep learning, um, and I'll tell you about deep learning later on, uh, changed, changed everything, actually. This is um, uh, a technique of machine learning that was able to beat humans in many of the tasks that uh, humans are doing uh, to the point that some people are I mean, for, for quite a while, we're, say, we're claiming that, uh, for example, we won't need any pathologist or any radiologist anymore because all this will be done by machines. It's not true, by the way, don't, don't, don't worry. <laughs> but uh, it is a fact that uh, for some uh, um, applications, these machines, thanks to deep learning, they were actually using something that we call neural networks is not an, a new technique, it's an old technique, but they were taking advantage of the new computers and the new uh, data that we have and all that stuff to, and I'll get back to that later, uh, to learn representations of the data that they are learning that can be exploited easily. You remember we need intelligence, you need to remember some knowledge and use it at the right time. So they were able to, uh, concisely represent knowledge in a very large collection and use it the right way to make decisions, to make predictions. Um, so what you need to retain is that in computer science, the field of computer science, we have a subfield called artificial intelligence. Uh, it's not the most important field. There are many other fields um, like uh, database management systems, security, uh, algorithm analysis, human computer interaction, networking, high performance computing, and so forth. But I'm representing it here big because I'm going to zoom in. It's as important as the other fields in computer science. Within artificial intelligence, you have machine learning as a subfield, but there are many other fields in AI like planning, uh, knowledge representation, reasoning, like somebody said uh, when I asked you to define it, uh, there's computer vision, there's natural language processing. But within machine learning, there is what we call supervised learning, and there is unsupervised and reinforcement learning and, and other uh, models. Uh, within supervised learning, you have deep learning and other paradigms as well. So deep learning is supervised learning within machine learning, which is within 
uh, uh, AI, which is within computing science, okay? This is the relationship between them. So what you need to remember is this, deep learning is machine learning, machine learning is AI. They're not synonymous. And in many magazines that you read, uh, they, they confuse them, they mix them up. Uh, it's, not the, it's not the case. Um, I have some definitions of data mining. I'll skip that because we don't have the time. Um, what is data science? I'll skip that. We don't have the time. So why, why is that AI is coming back now? I just told you it existed since the 50s. So 70 years that we are talking about AI, but suddenly it comes back now. Well, for a long time, um, AI went through these winters. We talked about, uh, well, I mentioned that there was a hype and then people were disappointed because we didn't deliver. So they went through these period of um, neglect or people were ignoring it completely. Do you call the, the winters of AI because there was no funding, no, no encouragement in the research there, nothing. But now it's coming back full force. And there's a reason for that. Um, there are three factors that play a huge role in this resurgence of AI. One of them is that we have a lot of data. We collect more data that you can think of. Everybody's collecting data, even on your phone. You're collecting way more data than we used to do. I mean, the generation before you was using with the tools that they have. I mean, imagine all the pictures that you take, all the activities that you do, all the emails, all the messages, all the pages that you check. We are collecting phenomenal amount of data. Um, there's another factor, which is uh, that computers are way better than they used to be, okay? And then the, the final um, factor is the, the, uh, uh, the possibility to have new algorithms that we couldn't um, try because we didn't have the data and because we didn't have the computers uh, that we have today. Let me... Um, well, I'll show you very briefly. I, I, I don't know the time we have. I, I have to go faster. Um, the, where's the data? I just mentioned an example about the data, the data uh, uh, from your activity online. Uh, you, you watch movies on Netflix, on YouTube, you go on Google and you do searches. You have activities on Facebook and Twitter, Pinterest and so forth. Every single minute, this is all data from 2017. And every single year they, they try to publish something to show the phenomenal amount of data that we are collecting every minute or every second, um, it's flabbergasting, basically. Uh, this is where the data is from, and this didn't exist before. Uh, this is new, okay? And people are using it um, because if they use it, they can um, understand you better, and if they understand you better, then they can uh, influence you, influence you either by enticing you to buy things or enticing you to vote for something or, or whatever. Uh, so it, it's valuable to many people. Um, and and um, just give you an example about the data in medicine. Um, uh, in medicine, um, well, not just in medicine, well, medicine in general, you have the internet of things because you have sensors in many places. Uh, you have the electronic medical record uh, you have information from, from insurance companies, the clinical trials, genome data, and social media can be used as well for medicine, like where people went, like for, for uh, uh, contact tracing and things like that. It can be used as well for uh, medicine. Um, actually, the text that people write, you can even detect their emotions and, and their mental health um, state. So this, all this data is available. Um, in 2011, so about 10 years ago, um, people estimated that the data that we were collecting is in the realm of the exabytes. Like exabytes that people don't even fathom or imagine what that is. Uh, so uh, some people attempted to visualize the quantity of data uh, by representing it with things that we can touch and, 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 well, concrete, basically. Um, so they actually calculated the amount of data that existed. Um, and then they said, what if 
we store this data on CDs. At that time, people understood what CDs were. We don't even use them anymore. Um, so we need that many CDs. Okay, now if we have that many CDs, then if we pile them up one on top of the other, knowing that each CD is about 1.2 millimeter, well, we will reach the moon. That gives you an idea about the amount of data that we are collecting. Um, uh, and, and, and a few years later, uh, people actually in the US said, well, forget the CDs and forget all the data. We just focus on medical data. And then they did the same study, but on medical data in the US alone. And they, instead of CDs, they put them on DVDs because DVDs can contain more. And uh, they showed that we can go to the moon twice <laughs> in just a few years. So like I showed you the, the exponential growth and in the innovation for technology, there's an, an exponential growth in the um, amount of data that we are collecting in all fields. And this is due to the fact that storing is cheap. Storing is getting cheaper and cheaper. And it's very easy to uh, store nowadays data. And this is just an example to show you the progression of the capacity of a, a micro SD card. So in a micro SD card in 2005, the biggest micro SD card was 128 megs. It became gigs just nine years later. And then in two, two years later, became, it doubled to 156. Today, you can get Actually, not today. In 2019, we were able already. It was expensive. Now it's not that expensive. But you can buy a micro SD card with one terabyte. I mean, you can put everything you want there. You don't have to change it, ever change it. Um, so from 128 to one gigs, we went 8,000 times more capacity in only 14 years. And this is phenomenal. On the same spot, on the same surface. That's why it's becoming very cheap and people store all that stuff. So just to give you an idea, in 1956, buying a five megabyte, five megs is not even a high resolution image today, but a five megabyte was $120,000. was so expensive that this is a picture of a, a hard drive from IBM, five megs being moved from one place to another. Even the captain of the plane was there for the photo op because it's such a big deal. And, 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 and today, I mean, this was, this was taken in 2018, 18 bucks for 64 gigs. Um, so that's, if, if I take this 64 gigs and move it back in time in 1956, it'll be a billion dollars. I mean, it's insane when you think about it, it's insane. Um, so this is a, a 76 million times improvement in, in half a century, a little bit more than half a century. Uh, and that's why I'm telling you, this is, there's an acceleration that is, we don't realize it uh, because we live it, but it's uh, when you step back and compare what existed and where, and where we are now, um, it's shocking actually. Um, <clears throat> now in terms of um, high performance computing, very quickly, I'll show you how uh, the progression happened is also as uh, 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 flabbergasting. Uh, everybody can buy a GPU today. This is a graphical processing unit that uh, gamers have on their computer to play games. Um, for a thousand bucks, thousand dollars, you can buy a GPU that is as powerful as Cray One machine that was existing in only few uh, a few countries because of an embargo. This is a high uh, performance computer. We don't sell it to all countries. Well, now you can buy, buy it from any store and put it on your home computer. It's, it's, it's crazy. Um, there are people who are uh, keeping statistics of these computers, the, the fastest computer in the world. Um, this started in, in 93. Uh, and here they have their performance and number of uh, floating point operations. So these are uh, operations on, on real numbers. And you, you can, and this is a, a logarithmic scale, and you can see how the progression is going. Forget the blue and the green. Just look at the the uh, purple, uh, not purple. This is the um, brown triangle. It shows you in every single year the most powerful computer at that time. Um, well, a few years ago, it was only the Chinese who had the the fastest computer, and then finally. Uh, and very recently, the Americans had the fastest computer. 
they were very happy to get the first place finally, but uh, they were beaten by, um, actually even then they improved it in 2020. And then last year, the Japanese beat the Americans uh, with the fastest computer in the world. Now uh, it is still the fastest computer in the world. And we're talking about hexaflops. Hexaflops, um, we are basically at, at this level here, which is, which is unbelievable. How many operations they can do in one second. Um, the, uh, yeah, this is just uh, comparing the different uh, computers. Well, the, uh, yeah, this is the interesting thing. These, these computers that we're talking about, they use a lot of energy, incredible amount of energy. Like this one is, we're talking about 28 megawatts. If you compare them to the human brain, the human brain uses only 12 watts. Okay, and it has 80 billion neurons. We're not uh, talking about 7.3 million CPUs, 90 billion to 100 billion neurons and just 12 watts. So we're, we're still far away from the capacity of this uh, human body, which is unbelievable. Um, but the progression is, is phenomenal. Um, I told you before that the, uh, the AI, you have it in your pocket. Well, if I look at the fastest, the fastest cell phones today, uh, the, the Apple one, the iPhone 12, um, has uh, uh, the, the, this particular chip, the bionic chip, 3.1 gigahertz in 2020. In the Android world, you have two competitors now, the Huawei and the OnePlus. I don't want to make uh, uh, advertisements, but basically the fastest cell phones today in these three, all these three are above one teraflop. One teraflop is here. And that means the computer that you have in your pocket, because the cell phone is a computer, the computer that you have in your pocket that you take for granted, you use every day. Well, it is equivalent to the fastest computer that existed in, in 1997. And this is the computer. And this computer in 1997 was $55 million. And it was consuming the energy equivalent to 800 houses. And now you have it in your pocket. Okay, the size was like a tennis court, was a huge. Well, let's see it again, that's the computer. And where's your phone? Here's your phone, I'm putting on the desk. That's the progression that happened. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, and it's every year, it's better and better and better. Um, so yeah, and so the, what is the progression? Remember, I told you it's a, it's a logarithmic scale. So this is the, let's say one of the fastest computer today. This is the fastest computer that was in 93 when I was doing my PhD. Uh, well, the difference, because it's a logarithmic scale is 206,000 times. What does that mean? What does that mean that this computer is 200,000 times slower than this one? Well, if I was doing the same progress and that's when I was doing my PhD, and this is today. If I did the same progress as these machines, well, I would be able to increase my step, for example, from one meter to 200,000 times more than one meter. That's, I, my step will be 206 kilometers. That's exactly what happened. It, this is how you, you have to imagine the progression that happened. Now, in terms of, of uh, uh, Capacity, it's the same thing. I increased 800,000 times, I told you. Uh, well, in terms of price, this is the price I showed you for 2018. This one, uh, um, this is this year in 2022, one, one terabyte. So 1,000 gigabyte, this is one terabyte. One terabyte SD, uh, micro SD card is only 40 bucks, $40. So if I did the progression the same way as uh, the, the cost of building these, these uh, um, memories, well, my step in 93 would be actually going around the world many times, okay? I'm gonna skip the early days. Otherwise we won't have the time. Um, yeah, so now in terms of development of computers, uh, I talked about it, the, the increase of the memory. Now the development of algorithms, well, now we are using these uh, computers that we have that are way faster than 
what they used to be in in, in 90 something or in the, in the 80s and and i'm using all this memory to store all the data that i want and we have a lot of data and i can build now algorithms that i couldn't do before uh, and this is where deep learning comes from um, so deep learning is not new it's a it's a rebranding of a technology that existed also from the 50s but evolved very slowly evolved very slowly because we didn't have the computers to run these and we were very limited physically and we were also very limited with the data that we can feed these uh, neural networks to learn so what is a neural network basically we have layers of neurons artificial neurons each artificial this is a zoom on the artificial neuron i have signals coming from other layers each signal has a weight okay and then i have a soma here that will sum all this information and then i have an activation function that will decide to send a signal forward exactly like a neuron so the neuron has the messages coming from the dendrid here and then at one point it sends a signal through the axon uh, to other neurons so the other layers and we have different layers in the olden days this idea existed but we were limited to the number of layers we can do today you can have oops where am i we can have many layers and that's why we call deep learning because it have it's deep in terms of layers that it can have uh, of course we can have now we can try different architectures uh, thanks to the computer that we have computers that we have so they're the different kinds of neural networks convolutional networks uh, recurrent neural networks and, and so forth um, okay and actually the pioneers in in this field that allowed neural networks to survive and now exist as deep learning they are actually in canada uh, there's a joshua benjo from the university of montreal and jeff hinton from uh, university of toronto there are other people as well, but even Jan Lecun, who is the uh, um, the leader of AI at Facebook or now Meta, is actually a postdoc of Jeff Hinden. Um, so what happened? Why why deep learning just changed the world? Uh, well, uh, there was a competition a few years ago. Um, now it's almost useless to do this competition, but uh, there was a competition where uh, people had to build programs to recognize objects and images. So you had um, 20, I believe 20,000 different categories, people, animals, flowers, whatever, you name it, buildings, cars, and so forth. And uh, there were 14 million images, and they had to write a program to learn to recognize these automatically. And this is the accuracy that there were uh, uh, reaching in 2009 when the competition started and every single year they improved and by 2011 they had an accuracy of 74 percent this is the accuracy of humans humans also make mistakes when they look at the images because the animal can be turned all the other way or only part of the plant or whatever so they they, they still make mistakes so typical human is in the 90 to 85 percent the expert human will be in the 95 percent so they still make some errors but they recognize most of the things well what happened is that in 2012 there was a small team from the university of toronto that competed and they beat every single one they beat everybody and and people asked them what did you do well they said well we used something that we call deep learning and we actually programmed it on our gpu this graphical processing unit that normally people use for games and that changed everything because they jumped from 74% to another, almost another order of magnitude, 10% more to 83%. And then the year after year, they continued to improve this deep learning thing. And now they beat the humans. They have better results and accuracy than the humans at that task. Okay. And, and why is it successful? It's not just in this uh, in this game, because as soon, well, it's not a game, this competition of recognizing objects and images, uh, because they were hired by Google, this team, and they said, oh, we need this. We have many images on the internet and we don't know how to index them. We need to know, this, does it have a cat? Does it have a dog? Does it have a bird? Uh, and they used their technique and it, it was excellent, worked very well. And then people said, well, can we, do, can we go beyond images? Can we use something else? 
And indeed, um, there's another competition, very popular competition, that started in the 90s, where uh, DARPA had a, a huge collection um, of uh, voice recording from people talking on the phone, and they needed somebody to transcribe all this. But hours and hours and hours of uh, conversations, you can't do it manually. You need it, you need it to be done automatically. And uh, many companies were trying this competition and many researchers, and here you have a different scale. So you have the time, and this is also a log scale, but this is the error rate. So the error rate you wanna go down, the lower, the better. And you can see that they started going down many techniques, but they plateaued, okay? Uh, and as soon as we introduced deep learning, it started going down, 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 and it reached the, the same level and better than the humans listening and transcribing, okay? So this shocked the world, and they tried deep learning in many different applications, like uh, 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 object detection, and they do better than humans. I mentioned that. Also in translation, they don't do better than humans, but it improved significantly. They tried it also for uh, question answering, and, and, and it, it does very close to humans. So for example, in the uh, comprehension text, it, it tests, you give it a text and somebody has to answer questions like you have in high school and in other uh, exams. Computers are doing better than the average human. They're not better than the best, but they, they're getting close. Um, but they're still making mistakes. Big mistakes that kids don't do, even babies don't do. It's, it's very ironic, this uh, big difference. So for example, who can tell me what do you see in this picture? You can unmute and say something. A desert. A desert. It's obvious, isn't it? Who can tell me something else? What do you see there? Do you see? Yeah? Go sand. Ahead. Sand, yeah. Desert, sand, dunes. Okay, yeah. It's obvious, but you know what you give it to deep learning that learned on many, 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 many images? Well, it'll tell you there's a picture of nude people. And this is a true story. It was uh, used by the police to detect pedophiles uh, and looking at the images that were exchanged and they find this image and they thought this is about ch ch child abuse. Okay, um, let's see another picture. What do you see here? What is this? Come on, have you ever seen this picture? No. Have you ever seen this object? No, but do you know what it is? What is it? A car? A car, yes, it's a car. How did you know it's a car? Have you ever seen it before? Well. It's they look like a dragon. You have teeth here, you have eyes here, or maybe it's an insect, a zoom on an insect or something like that. But you manage to say it's a car. Do you see the wheels? No. Um, it's amazing how we humans can do this analogy with information that we collected from our experience and still say it's a car, even though we never saw this car, it's new to us. Well, if you give it to deep learning, do you know what it'll tell you? It's a horse. Why it's a horse? Well, because there is a horse there. Well, let's make it easier. I'll turn the car, since you said it's a car, I'll turn it. Here it's a car. Now I can see the wheels. Now, yes, it's a car. I think the computer with deep learning will recognize it. Well, not, a, not again. It's not just one horse. Actually, there are many horses. So it still makes mistakes, silly mistakes. Um, some are really bad, some are less bad, but still. Uh, like here you have a picture, deep learning is trying to describe, which is impressive actually, describe what is in the pictures. And here it says a soccer player is kicking a soccer ball. Is he kicking the soccer ball? Not really. He's actually standing in front of the, the soccer ball. Here it says a street sign on a pole in front of a building. Uh, we humans can see that there is depth here. Actually, it can be on the other side of the street. 
not necessarily in front of the building. Here you have a couple of giraffes standing next to each other. Are they really standing next to each other? They're actually a few meters apart. Okay. Um, well, these may seem easy. Uh, look at this one. How would the computer recognize uh, a dog from a bagel? What about this one? Chihuahua for muffins. Uh, <laughs> for us, it's also tough. <laughs> but if you put them both in the same picture, Chihuahua and a muffin, it's even more complicated. <laughs> what about these? Watch out what you bite. Uh, here's another one, funny one. Well, people are uh, on purpose trying to find these cases where it's hard. Um, but more than that, they're trying to trick the computer to make mistakes, attacks on these systems that uh, apparently are trying to detect things using deep learning. Uh, here's an example. This is what a panda looks like. This is what a gibbon looks like. So with deep learning, you can teach the computer to recognize uh, different animals. And when you show it this, uh, this picture, it'll say, yeah, it's a panda. I have 57% confidence that it's a panda. Why? Because I don't see the whole panda, it's cut. It's not bad that just from the, from the face, it recognizes it's a panda. It's not bad at all. But if I take this image and I add noise to it, okay, this noise, uh, you will not be visible to us. And I, I generate this image um, from this first one. And when I give it to the computer, the computer suddenly says, oh, it's a gibbon. And it's 99% confidence. So not only it changed the prediction, the confidence went high up, like it's almost 100%. Oh, yeah, it's a gibbon. Why? Because, yeah, well, if I focus just on the face, it, I have some features there. Here's another kind of attack. I have a picture of a banana and I ask the computer, what is it? And it tells me, well, it's a banana, uh, high confidence here. It could be a slug, it could be a snail, it could be an orange, but very small confidence, very obvious high confidence that it is a banana. Now I add the sticker, this funny sticker. It looks like a cell with, I don't know, uh, Nicholas and the Golgi apparatus and whatever. I put it here on the picture and I say, okay, what is this? Well, the computer says, oh, it's a toaster. Uh, it could be a banana, but I have less accuracy and less uh, confidence. And look at this confidence about the toaster. Why? Because, yeah, because of these things here, it looks like a toaster based on pictures of toasters that it saw before. So it is actually easy to attack these, these systems, um, relatively easy, let's say. Um, so what is machine learning? We talked about AI and, and this deep learning that is changing things uh, because of amazing applications. But what is machine learning? And I said that deep learning is part of machine learning. Machine learning uh, provides a means to machine programs to learn from large data uh, interpret the trends in that data and then adapt to the data as the data changes. So basically we learn from experience, the data is the experience, and I learn to predict in order to adapt to an environment. Um, so deep learning is one of those techniques, there are many, uh, many techniques, and they require training data. That's the experience that I have to provide. I have to provide some uh, experience. Um, so the picture that I want you to remember is the following. I have data that is labeled that I provide as training. The algorithm goes through it and builds a representation, a model that it now will use when I have new data that has never been seen before, hasn't been labeled. This was training has been labeled, but this one hasn't been labeled. So I will use this model to predict the labels automatically based on the experience that I had here. Okay, that's what we call supervised learning. It's supervised because I'm supervising it, giving it the training data, okay? And that model that it learns could be a neural network, could be deep learning, but there are many other methods that exist as well, okay? Uh, there's also reinforcement learning, which is a, a method in, mach uh, well, a, a, a field in machine learning and uh, 
uh, U of A is famous for that. Um, I may have a slide about it explaining what it is. Um, so AI is much more than deep learning, basically. But what is special about deep learning? What, is, what makes it so peculiar and particular compared to other methods? Well, if I try to measure the performance of learning compared to uh, the, uh, I mean, how, do, how does performance change as I'm increasing the amount of data for supervision that I provide for learning? If I look at the red curve, these are the old methods that existed. So the more I add data, the more it, it, it improves, it improves, but it reaches a plateau where it doesn't know what to do with extra data. It reached the maximum. If it goes up, it's very, very, very slow. Deep learning, the more data you give it, the more it gets better. And that's why at one point, if you give it enough data, it surpasses what humans can do in a particular field where you provided the training data for. For example, the recognizing melanoma, okay? Or recognizing, um, I don't know, uh, breast cancer, uh, a very specific case. So we use this machine learning in many, many applications, like for example, as I mentioned, uh, detecting spam. Um, spam, you don't have to say what is spam, what is non-spam. It looks at your behavior when you delete things, put them in, uh, you don't even read them, you delete them, and the others you answer and you save. And so it learns with your activities, with your behavior, it learns to distinguish. Uh, the supervision that you give it is your behavior. Uh, here's another example, uh, credit card approval or credit in general approval. You go to the bank, you ask for a loan. Well, they pretend that they are looking at your file and telling you this or that. Actually, they enter all that stuff in a computer that checks the previous experience. What is the previous experience? Is basically all those clients that came, I have their uh, age, I have their uh, status, they have whether they own a house or not and whatever, but I also have information whether they paid back the loan or they defaulted on the loan. So I can look at now your file and use that information to predict whether you have a high chance to default or you have a high chance to pay back. So we use machine learning to do that and that's how we get that uh, score. Um, also for credit cards, when you scan your card and it go, the request goes for an authorization, basically they're looking also at that transaction. Does it fit the model that they build about you concerning your purchases? Or is this, uh, I don't know, pot potentially fraudulent? Should I raise a flag or not? So they use machine learning too. Um, there are many, many, many applications in medicine and I'll, I'll get to that uh, later on. Uh, for precision health, the guts of precision health is actually machine learning. Um, uh, there are many unusual applications too, and I love talking about this one. Um, imagine a paraplegic on a wheelchair, can't use the arms, can't use anything to make it work. Um, so you have somebody else pushing the, 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 the wheelchair. Well, now with machine learning, they can operate the the uh, wheelchair without even using their fingers or hands or anything, just by thinking. How do they do that? Well, with a, 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 like a hat that has electrodes measuring the brain activity, they can measure the brain activity when somebody is trying to do a particular um, action. For example, they say, okay, try to move your left toe. Uh, they can't move the left or they are paraplegic, but just by thinking about it, it sends a signal. And then doing it often, then the system learns to recognize that signature for the brain activity when somebody is trying to move the left toe. And then they do the same thing for whatever, the right elbow or the head or whatever. And then they associate that to the actions of the wheelchair. Now, if they, I wanna turn left, I think about wiggling my left turn, if I want uh, my, 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 my left toe. Uh, if I want to stop, I think about, I don't know, uh, winking or things like that. So each patient is something else so that they can get a clear signal. Uh, they can now operate the wheelchair just by thinking. 
They can also operate a cursor on the screen to choose the letter that they want to write. And now they can dictate things to write just by thinking about it. Uh, how? Using machine learning to learn to recognize these signals in the brain. Um, now I said about reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is completely different. It learns, but it learns from experience, um, tri trial and error kind of thing. And, and uh, when they try and they succeed, then they learn from it. And when they try and fail, they learn from it. How do they learn from it? They learn by uh, getting a, a kind of a reward. When, when they succeed, they get a positive reward. When they fail, they get a negative reward. And their goal is to maximize the reward that they get. The reward, like a child, you, you praise them or you give them a sweet or whatever when they do something good, or you may punish them or look at them in the wrong way when they do something bad, uh, that's the reward they get. For a computer, it'll be just uh, adding a number, plus one, plus one, minus one, minus one, whatever, whatever that function is. Okay, You can see also uh, animals, you can tell them roll, roll. When they roll, you give them a biscuit or you give them some treat. They learn to roll in order to get the sweet. The computer will learn in the same way. So basically you have an agent, a, a computer and a, and a program, and you have the environment, the agent has a set of actions it can do. Um, I'm representing them here by tools. It will select it, an action, it does the action, and, and then they have an observer that says, oh, that action that you did, did this change, it changed this state of the environment. So here's the new state, by the way. And uh, also, uh, because of your action, I'm giving you this reward. And what the agent is learning, it learns a policy, what to choose given this, the, the state of the environment, what to choose, what is the best action that will down the road maximize my, my reward, okay? And the pioneer in, in, the pioneer in this field is uh, uh, Rich Sutton, who is at the University of Alberta. What can we do with this? Well, here's an example. Um, that we are working on uh, on this year, actually at, at U of A. And I don't know if uh, Patrick Pilarski will talk again this year. Yes, so Patrick yes. Pilarski is the lead in this. Um, <clears throat> you can teach uh, a prosthetic, adaptive prosthetic. You can teach a prosthetic to adapt to the patient. So it's not only the patient is adapting to this new prosthetic, the prosthetic is also adapting to me. And it learns to predict the actions that I'm going to do and start doing them before I am actually, before I do them. Uh, the example that I give, and imagine you are, you are driving um, and you're trying to, to change uh, gears. Let's suppose you're using a, a stick shift. The fact that you're moving your hand towards it, you're opening your fists and you're preparing your fingers to grab the, you do it instinctively, but when you program a computer and a robot, it, it's very mechanical kind of move. But with reinforcement learning, you make it very natural. Is that because it predicts that you're going to grab this one. I'm predicting to grab something from the cupboards. So as I'm moving my arm up there, I'm preparing my hand to grab it. Uh, so all that is done uh, with reinforcement learning. Now the prosthetic looks like a real kind of hand and arms. Did I go beyond my time again, as usual, or I'm, I'm on time? No. Oh, okay. Then I will give some time um, for the audience to ask questions. That was good. Okay. That's my presentation for today. Any okay. questions? Or comments or criticism or whatever you want. <laughs> Verbalization by the students. Huh? Yeah, you know, I, I'll tell you something. I, I teach in the morning, every single morning I teach and I'm talking to a screen. I have a class of 170 students and it's like there's nobody there because they don't even turn on the, the, their cameras. And, and I'm, it's worse than talking to a mirror. At least in the mirror, I see myself. Yeah, I'm talking to a screen. So please talk and say something, comment, <laughs> ask questions. Why are you shocked? I don't okay. have a question, but thank you. The class was amazing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so two of these students are from the same family and they're 
from Pakistan, and for a long while they were stuck there, but oh. now they've made their way back to Edmonton. And then there's another family represented here, the Grozdanik family. They've had three students from that family taking the course, and they have two more family members. So <laughs> they're going for- Everybody through the course, that's cool. For a, for a record, yeah. So why don't we have either a Mahal question or a Grozdanik question or both, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for this presentation. It was super interesting to kind of learn into these concepts. Um, I don't really have much prior knowledge to, um, to any of this. So it's kind of like kind of eye-opening to, to really put these things into perspective. So yeah, thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, thanks so much for me as well. This kind of interesting too, because every class is like around AI, but every single lecture, I feel like I find like something different. So that's really cool. But I also think it's really neat how you were talking about that, like um, the singularity, like it might be quite a far ways away and it's maybe not as like close to us as we think. So that's something, yeah, new I learned today. So that's cool. Yeah, I, I think the important, uh, message that also I want to convey about the singularity uh, because the singularity either people are very excited and waiting for it and then there's a hype and they may be disappointed because it's longer than what they expected or they don't want it to happen and it creates fear because oh it's tomorrow this will happen so then we would better stop it now it, it, well we shouldn't create this fear and we shouldn't create the hype either I think we have to be a little bit uh, realistic. Um, prepare for it. Um, shouldn't take too much time to prepare for it. We have to start very early preparing for it because indeed it can, can go the wrong direction, not because of it. It can go in the wrong direction because of us. You always have somebody who thinks about a different use of whatever technology you build. There's always a secondary use for technology and, and uh, um, yeah, it can go, it can go the, um, I don't want to say get to go south because south means something else, but it can go bad um, if we are not taking uh, uh, care of what we're doing. But it's not for immediately tomorrow. It'll, it'll take some time. So on uh, Thursday, I'll bring the robotic dog. Actually, Osmer and his uh, team helped me to get this dog across the border. I think it's, it's the only one in uh, Canada. So we'll bring, his, his name is Einstein. Yeah, so we'll bring <laughs> Einstein on Thursday. You, you should get a, a kind of wig, a small wig and put it on the head of uh, Einstein. <laughs> yeah. That'd be cool. <laughs> I, I can do that. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you very much. And we look forward to Thursday and next week. Yeah, we have a whole series of um, AI lectures. Um, so Rich Sutton is, is teaching on March 1st, which is future day, but it's kind of interesting. He doesn't really believe in the concept of future day. So, so we might not do anything particularly special for future day. We'll, we'll see what happens. And in between, we have Patrick Polarski. Yeah, so you, yeah, we'll, you'll, you'll, you'll gradually learn a lot about artificial intelligence. Yeah. yeah. So any other questions or comments? So somebody's talking Dr. about uh, the background. Is it your drawing? I think it oh, is. I think sorry of the like of the dog you had earlier. I think at one point is that the dog that you're talking about, the one that yeah. was in the drawing with you. Oh, okay, cool. Yes, yes, that's the dog that will, that will be here on Thursday. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, okay, so thank you very much, and, and we'll see you all on can, Thursday. Can you stay online after stopping the recording? I'd like to talk to you about something. Sure, yeah.
So I'm going to.